There we go. Found a bull mess. Yeah. Tell me about the construction. You know, the wolf. We had about 5,000 hours on the, on the R2. They also had four guys. They built it in about, just about a year and said that if he knew what he was getting into, he'd never do it again. Yeah, we, we ended up with about between five and 6,000 man hours total, including the drawing time. Um, it's been about 11 or 1,200 hours in front of the computer making drawings. Um, you know, drawings or engineering or whatever I was doing in front of the computer. But that time really paid off in the shop because I could spend in 15 minutes time at the machine and try three different ways of doing something put two parts together and then figure out, oh, I like this one. And then we just take, carry that one out on paper and build it. So we didn't do a lot of learning at the airplane. We tried to do all that ahead of time. And then by the time the weekend came along or that evening, we had a list of two weekends worth of stuff that we could possibly do. And we'd go as far as we can till we hit a brick wall and then pick up another one to start on it. But the we basically had like two and a half people Jeff and myself, and then if you include the, some of the other people that helped, like his dad or my dad or the, the guy that did the machine work on the gear, the guy, a friend of mine that built the wing ribs, um, those kind of things. So we, we kind of counted as two and a half people working on it, and we did it in um, three and a half years from when we decided to do it, um, it flew, three and a half years. But less than three years from when we made the first part when it flew. What was the first part you made? The oh, tail feathers. Welded those up. And um, next was a fuselage. I got the wing rib drawings, the wing drawings done to where Jeff Morgan could get started on. And he built them in exchange for a set of factory S1S drawings we bought and traded them. And um, then we built the fuselage frame and then stood it in a corner the basic frame, and then we had the basic tail feathers done uh, all by the December of the first year, and then uh, of construction. You know, so it was at three or four months we had the steel parts for the tail and the steel parts for the fuselage. We didn't have any landing gear, we didn't have any wings or anything like that. So then we then we started building the wings and building the spars and all the components and all the wing fittings. It took us quite a few months to get the wing fittings all built. And that really came together sun and around Sun and Fun 94 is the first time we had the wings were together, slipped together enough that they could actually be temporarily stuck on the airplane. They weren't glued up, but you know, the wing ribs slid on the spars, that kind of thing. What so. did you uh, start with initially as far as plans? I mean, you, you had very little to go on. Yeah, we, we bought, several different sources of model airplane drawings. We bought Vern Clements drawings. We bought, um, ugh, gotta think of some of the other guys, just different drawings that we, we picked up. Um, and everyone, there's inf good information on every, from all these sources. We also got um, an engineering paper that the Granville brothers presented to the SAE uh, in, near the end of 31, before the crash of the airplane. And, um, in it, it had a lot of technical data in it. The front fuselage truss is made out of two inch 095 tubing. The spars on 25 and a half inch centers, the wing ribs on 5.4 inch centers, compression tubes on this. I uh, would say something like the, the trim mechanism for the stabilizer is made, up, made similar to a Model Y, um, things like that. Then uh, Primo Galetti provided us with a lot of information. We got a copy of his, um, 1931 Modeler 3 view that they put out that the Granville sold for a buck fifty in 1931 in the Aero Digest. And we, he took that in the 60s and sat down with Ed Granville and had him uh, make notes all over it, just what he could remember about the airplane. You know, on it, he showed the original tail shape, which had the straight back headrest and no, no vertical fin up over the top on this airplane. They originally thought to do that on this and chickened out before they ever built it. And then they tried it on the R1. Um, it showed that they had the cotton interior. It showed that it had an aluminum covered seat. Um, it said the tubing 
was not painted. It was just rubbed down with lime oil, gave a black color. So that's why we painted our fuselage tubing black. Uh, just a lot of little details like that. Good information. Boy, that's great. So then, um, then pictures. And we found a lot of pictures that gave us a lot of good information. What was the toughest part about building that was unexpected? Hmm. toughest part is staying at it, the perseverance, you know, just keep pushing and pushing and pushing and, and um, losing all the brownie points for not being home and all that kind of stuff. Because, you know, it, it, for, for a lot of people, and, and like Jeff, it was, a, you know, it was a hobby. So he would be at work, leave, you know, leave work or go to work after working on the airplane. And so this was something totally different. I work on airplanes for a living, so I'd work on airplanes till five, and then work on airplanes till midnight for fun, and then being up all night welding parts and things like that. So, um, just staying at it, keeping the energy up and enthusiasm. We found that if we if we decided to take a week off and just do away with it, it turned into two months, just like that. So we had to try to just keep knocking a little piece at a time. But the airplane itself, there wasn't a lot of it that was that's really difficult. There's a lot of things we had to learn. There's a lot of things that we knew how to do that we just had to apply to build in this particular airplane. What about the cowl? I, mean, that's the, I know the, the cowl on the R2 was, was a pretty tough, pretty tough thing, but the, was that all hand rolled out on the English wheel, or how did you do that? The, the cowling um, was about the last thing we had to make before Sun and Fun of this year. It was by the 1st of April, the airplane was basically done, except for the engine cowling and the artwork. Uh, the sign work. Um, started, I had a nose bowl about half built and it really wasn't going the way I wanted to. I was using a planishing hammer, often flat stock, and planishing hammer and English wheel and things like that, shaping just the nose bowl back to here. And it really wasn't going the way I wanted to. And, and the time that I had was, it was really just sucking up a lot of time. So I didn't have time to build things like the brackets, the mounting hoop, a whole bunch of other parts. So then we, we had, Jim Yunkin volunteered to make this piece for us, the skins. And so he made that while we made this, all the mounting hoops, everything else involved on the cowling. And this is like, um, let's see, the cowling showed up on about the 8th or 9th of April, and the airplane was at Sun and Fun with the cowling looking just like this on the 14th. So, you know, we, we really just we really worked on getting that finished up in a hurry. But. Was, was this also, I, I, I know this was Jeff's dream, like the flight to see and, and wanted to see it go up. What about you? What is it about this airplane that, that makes it worth such a long amount of man hours to build it? I think it's just one of the neatest airplanes of all time. I mean, I can, I can remember just seeing it and just wanting to, just, you know, just the awe of what it is. Um, really what got me going is I wanted to, I don't remember. Oh, why? Um, just a, an awesome airplane. We've always liked it. Um, we really kind of backdoored into it. We didn't plan on building the Z. We just, we were going to build maybe what we would have built if we were alive in the 30s. And then the Z project came available and it turned out to be junk and we didn't use it. And we started over. We, we were already stuck on the airplane at that point. So then we just decided to attack it as best we could and as accurate as we could. And um, I just wanted to prove that I could do it. And I think we did. So it seems to work. What was your reaction to the first flight? Before, before or after? Both. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was nervous, re really just nervous, really nervous, until the power came up and the tail came up. And once it was there, then I knew it was, everything was okay. Just at that point, it finally seemed everything was okay. Um, and then seeing it fly around was just, you know, hard to describe, it's really nice. And um, then once he landed it and that seemed to work, then like I said before, I can finally check off that last little box on the, on the, on the list of things you have to do to make an airplane and it seemed to work. So. That's about it. Let's talk a little bit, um, last question, about the, the history of, of this airplane and, and what happened to it in, in 1931. There's a lot of different stories. And, and through your research, what were you able to determine? In 1931? 
from the failure. Um, the airplane was being flown beyond its design limits uh, of speed. I don't know how many G's he probably pulled on it, but he was, you know, he's diving in and, and watching the tape of it. It pitches down and then comes back through horizontal. And it just, there's, I don't know how many G's he could have put on it right there. Um, there's several things that could, could have happened to the airplane. Be tough, huh? <laughs> well, let's just tell me what they were trying for it at that time and then what happened and what you think was. They were, they were trying to set the world land plane speed record and they needed to do about 300 and change miles an hour or something like that to, to well, around 300 to make it work. Um, the airplane had seen 267 and change in the speed runs in Cleveland in September, but that wasn't enough to get it. So they put the 1340 on it, up the horsepower, another 200 horsepower over what they had, uh, more weight in the airplane, and it was a, the day in Detroit in December was not the best day possible. It was looking you know, pretty, pretty rough, a lot of wind blowing and everything else. So it, you know, he could have, in the speed run, he could have easily just hit you know, some turbulence, and then that caused it. One newspaper account has the pedo head landing at a guy's feet at the start end of the course long before the airplane broke downstream. So it could have been flutter. Maybe the tip fluttered. Um, you know, maybe just pulled too hard. Maybe, you know, I don't know. But I really don't think that the, the gas cap could have gone through the windshield because the gas cap, the airplane's going 320 miles an hour. The gas cap's going 320 miles an hour. And it would have to slow down to about 150 miles an hour to have enough differential force to go through the windshield. So I don't think it did it. I think that was just what they, someone mentioned that it could have happened and they jumped on it to not have a bad airplane day. So. What, uh, what speeds did he reach? He got over 300, right? He was over 300, at, but uh, I guess on the first day, the couple passes, it was close to 314 average, but there just weren't enough passes before the time and equipment failed. He needed four passes, and I think they got two or three off before the equipment failed. Um, so, uh, you know, had he, had he even made the, the record at 300, then the 297 in 1932 with the R1 wouldn't have been good enough. So um, they would have had to push harder with it to make it work. <laughs>